because we bore witness to the tears and cries of pain, the monetary aid we'd anonymously provided to make sure there was no unnecessary physical suffering seemed crass in retrospect. Such a weak recompense. She gave up waiting for an answer. I guess I know. Her expression was mournful now. Did she condemn Emmett while she gave me so much mercy? His crimes, though much greater than two, were less in total than mine. It pained me that she would think badly of him. Was this the specificity of two victims? The offense she would balk at? Even the strongest of us fall off the wagon, don't we? I asked weakly. Could this be forgiven, too? Perhaps not. She winced, flinching away from me. No more than an inch, but it felt like a yard. Her lips pulled into a frown. What are you asking? My permission? The hard edge in her voice sounded like sarcasm. So here was her limit. I'd thought she'd been extraordinarily kind and merciful, too forgiving in truth. But actually, she'd simply underestimated my depravity. She must have thought that, for all my warnings, I'd only ever been tempted that I'd always made the better choice, as I had in Port Angeles, driving away from bloodshed. I told her that same night how, despite our best efforts, my family made mistakes. Had she not realized that I'd been confessing to murder? No wonder she accepted things so easily. She thought I was always strong, that I only had ne near misses on my conscience. Well, it wasn't her fault. I'd never explicitly admitted to killing anyone. I'd never given her the body count. Her expression softened while I spiraled. I tried to think of how to say goodbye in such a way that she would know how much I loved her, but not feel threatened by that love. I mean, she explained suddenly, no edge in her tone. Is there no hope, then? In a fraction of a second, I replayed our last exchange in my head and realized how I'd misinterpreted her reaction. When I had begged pardon for past sins, she'd thought I was excusing future, but imminent crime. That I meant to, no, no. I had to fight to slow my words down to human speed. I was in such a hurry to have her hear them. Of course there's hope. I mean, of course I won't kill you. I couldn't finish the sentence. Those words were agony to me, imagining her gone. My eyes bored into hers, trying to communicate everything I couldn't say. It's different for us, I promised, Emmett. These were strangers he happened to cross. It was a long time ago, and he wasn't as practiced, as careful as he is now. She sifted through my words, heard the parts I hadn't said. So, if we'd met... She paused, searching for the right scenario. Oh, in a dark alley or something? Ah, here was a bitter truth. It took everything I had not to jump up in the middle of that class full of children and kill you. My eyes fell from hers, so much shame. Still, I couldn't leave her any flattering illusions about me. When you walked past me, I admitted, I could have ruined everything Carlisle has built for us, right then and there. If I hadn't been denying my thirst for the last, well, too many years, I wouldn't have been able to stop myself. I could see the classroom so clearly in my mind. Perfect recall was more a curse than a gift. Did I need to remember with such precision every second of that hour? The fear that had dilated her eyes? The reflection of my monstrous countenance in them? The way her scent had destroyed every good thing about me? Her expression was far away. 
Maybe she was remembering, too. You must have thought I was possessed. She didn't deny it. I couldn't understand why, she said in a fragile voice. How you could hate me so quickly. She'd intuited the truth in that moment. She'd understood correctly that I had hated her. Almost as much as I'd desired her. To me, it was like you were some kind of demon, summoned straight from my own personal hell to ruin me. It was painful to relive the emotion of it, to remember seeing her as prey. The fragrance coming off of your skin. I thought it would make me deranged that first day. In that one hour, I thought of a hundred different ways to lure you from the room with me to get you alone. And I fought them each back, thinking of my family, what I could do to them. I had to run out, to get away before I could speak the words that would make you follow. You would have come. What must it be like for her to know this? How did she align the opposing facts? Me, would-be murderer, and me, would-be lover? What did she think of my confidence? My certainty that she would have followed the murderer. Her chin lifted a centimeter. Without a doubt, she agreed. Our hands were still carefully intertwined. Hers were nearly as still as mine, aside from the blood pulsing through them. I wondered if she felt the same fear that I did. The fear that they might have to come apart and she wouldn't be able to find the courage and forgiveness necessary to bring them together again. It was a little easier to confess when I wasn't looking into her eyes. And then I continued, as I tried to rearrange my schedule in a pointless attempt to avoid you. You were there, in that close, warm little room. The scent was maddening. I so very nearly took you then, there was only one other frail human there, so easily dealt with. I felt the shiver move down her arms to her hands. With every new attempt to explain, I found myself using more and more distressing words. They were the right words, the truthful words, and they were also so ugly. There was no stopping them now, though, and she sat silent and nearly motionless as they gushed out of me. More confessions mixed up in explanations. I told her about my unsuccessful attempt to run away and the arrogance that brought me back. How that arrogance had shaped our interactions and how the frustration of her hidden thoughts had tormented me. How her scent had never stopped being both torture and temptation. My family wove in and out of the story and I wondered whether she could see how they influenced my actions at every turn. I told her how saving her from Tyler's van had changed my perspective, had forced me to see that she was more to me than just a risk and an, ir and an irritant. In the hospital? She prompted when my words ran out. She studied my face with compassion, with eager, non-judgmental desire for the next chapter. I was no longer shocked by her benevolence, but it would always be miraculous to me. I explained my misgivings, not for saving her, but for exposing myself and consequently my family, so that she would understand my harshness that day in the empty corridor. This led naturally into my family's varied reactions, and I wondered what she thought of the fact that some of them had wanted to silence her in the most permanent way possible. She didn't shiver now, or betray any fear. How strange it must be for her, to learn the whole story, the dark now woven through the light she'd known. I told her how I'd tried to feign total indifference to her after that, to protect us all, and how unsuccessful I'd been. I wondered privately, not for the first time, where I would be now if I had not acted so instinctively that day in the school parking lot, if, as I'd just grotesquely described to her, 
I had stood by and let her die in a car accident, then revealed myself to the human witnesses in the most monstrous way possible. My family would have had to flee Forks immediately. I imagined their reactions to that version of events would have been mostly the opposite. Rosalie and Jasper would not have been angry, a trifle smug, perhaps, but understanding. Carlyle would have been deeply disappointed, but still forgiving. Would Alice have mourned the friend she'd never gotten to meet? Only Esme and Emmett would have reacted in a manner nearly identical to their first reactions. Esme with concern for my well-being, Emmett with a shrug. I knew that I would have had some small inkling of the disaster that had befallen me. Even that early, after just a few words exchanged, my fascination with her was strong. But could I have guessed the vastness of the tragedy? I thought not. I would have ached, certainly, and then gone about my ha empty half-life, never realizing how much I had lost, never knowing actual happiness. It would have been easier to lose her then, I knew. Just as I would never have known joy, I wouldn't have suffered the depths of pain I now knew to exist. I contemplated her kind, sweet face, so dear to me now, so much the center of my world, the only thing I wanted to look at for the rest of time. She gazed back, the same wonder in her eyes. And for all that, I concluded my long confession. I'd have fared better if I had exposed us all at that first moment than if now, here, with no witnesses and nothing to stop me, I were to hurt you. Her eyes widened, not in fear or surprise. Fascination. Why? She asked. This explanation would be as difficult as any of the others, with many words I hated to say, but there were also words I very much wanted to speak to her. Isabella. Bella. It was a pleasure just to say her name. It felt like a kind of avowal. This is the name to which I belong. I carefully loosed one hand and stroked her soft hair warm from the sun. The joy of the simple touch, the knowledge that I was free to reach out to her this way, was overwhelming. I grasped her hands again. I couldn't live with myself if I ever hurt you. You don't know how it's tortured me. I hated to look away from her sympathetic expression, but it was too hard to see her other face, the one from Alice's vision in the same frame. The thought of you, still, white, cold. To never see you blush scarlet again. To never see that flash of intuition in your eyes when you see through my pretenses. It would be unendurable. That word did nothing to convey the anguish behind the thought. But I was through the ugly part now. And I could say the things I'd wanted to tell her for so long. I met her eyes again, rejoicing in this confession. You are the most important thing to me now. The most important thing to me ever. Just as the word unendurable was not enough, so were these words weak echoes of the feelings they tried to describe. I hoped she could see in my eyes exactly how inadequate they were. She was always better at knowing my mind than I was at reading hers. She held my exultant gaze for just a moment, pink creeping into her cheeks, but then her eyes fell to our hands. I thrilled to the beauty of her complexion, seeing only the loveliness and nothing else. You already know how I feel, of course, she said, her voice not much louder than a whisper. I'm here, which roughly translated means I would rather die than stay away from you. I wouldn't have thought it possible to feel such euphoria and such regret at the same time. She wanted me, bliss. She was risking her very life for me, 
unacceptable. She scowled, her eyes still lowered. I'm an idiot. I laughed at her conclusion. From a certain angle, she had a point. Any species that ran so headlong into the arms of its most dangerous predator wouldn't survive long. It was a good thing she was an outlier. You are an idiot. I teased gently, and I would never stop being grateful for it. Bella glanced up with a puckish grin, and we both laughed together. It was such a relief to laugh after my grueling revelations that my laugh shifted from horror to sheer joy. I was sure she felt the same. We were utterly in sync for one perfect moment. Though it was impossible, we belonged together. Everything was wrong with this picture. A killer and an innocent leaning close, each basking in the presence of the other, totally at peace. It was as if we'd somehow ascended to a better world where such impossibilities could exist. I was suddenly reminded of a painting I had seen many years ago. Whenever we canvassed the countryside for likely towns in which to settle, Carla would frequently make side trips to duck into old parish churches. He seemed unable to stop himself. Something about the simple wooden structures, usually dark for lack of good windows, the floorboards and ba pew backs all worn smooth and smelling of layer upon layer of human touches, brought him a reflective kind of calm. Thoughts of his father and his childhood were brought to the fore, but the violent end seemed far away in those moments. He remembered only pleasant things. On one such diversion, we found an old Quaker meeting house around 30 miles north of Philadelphia. It was a small building, no bigger than a farmhouse, with a stone interior and a very Spartan arrangement inside. So plain were the knotty floors and straight-backed pews that I was almost shocked to see an adornment on the far wall. Carlyle's interest was piqued as well, and we both examined it. It was quite a small painting, no more than 15 inches square. I guess that it was older than the stone church that housed it. The artist was clearly untrained, his style amateurish. And yet, there was something in the symbol, poorly wrought image that managed to convey an emotion. There was a warm vulnerability to the animals depicted, an aching kind of tenderness. I was strangely moved by this kinder universe the artist had envisioned. A better world, Carlyle had thought to himself. The sort of world where this present moment could exist, I thought now and felt that aching tenderness again. And so the lion fell in love with the lamb. I whispered. Her eyes were so open and accessible for one second, and then she flushed again and looked down. She steadied her breath for a moment, and her impish smile returned. What a stupid lamb. She teased, stretching out the joke. What a sick, masochistic lion. I countered. I wasn't sure that was a true statement, though. In one light, yes. I was deliberately causing myself unnecessary pain and enjoying it. The textbook definition of masochism. But the pain was the price. And the reward was so much more than the pain. Really, the price was negligible. I would pay it ten times over. Why? She murmured, hesitant. I smiled at her, eager to know her mind. Yes? A hint of the forehead crease began to form. Tell me why you ran from me before. Her words hit me physically, lodging in the pit of my stomach. I couldn't understand why she would want to re rehash a moment so loathsome. You know why. She shook her head, and her brows pulled down. No, I mean, exactly what did I do wrong? She spoke intently, serious now. I'll have to be on my guard, you see, so I better start learning what I shouldn't do. 
this, for example? She stroked her fingertips slowly up the back of my hand to my wrist, leaving a trail of painless fire. Seems to be all right. How like her to take the responsibility on herself. You didn't do anything wrong, Bella. It was my fault. Her chin lifted. It would have implied stubbornness if her eyes were not so pleading. But I want to help, if I can, to not make this harder for you. My first instinct was to continue insisting that this was my problem and was not something for her to worry about. Yet, I knew that she was simply trying to understand me with all my strange and monstrous quirks. She would be happier if I just answered her question as clearly as possible. How to explain bloodlust, though? So shameful. Well, it was just how close you were. Most humans instinctively shy away from us, are repelled by our alienness. I wasn't expecting you to come so close, and the smell of your throat. I broke off, hoping I had not disgusted her. Her mouth was pursed as if fighting off a smile. Okay, then, no throat exposure. She made a show of tucking her chin against her right collarbone. It was clearly her intention to ease my anxiety, and it worked. I had to laugh at her expression. No, really, I reassured her. It was more the surprise than anything else. I lifted my hand again and rested it lightly against her neck, feeling the incredible softness of her skin there, the warm give of it. My thumb grazed her jawline. The electric pulse that only she could awaken started to thrum through my body. You see, I whispered, perfectly fine. Her pulse began to race as well. I could feel it under my hand and hear her galloping heart. Pink flooded her face from her chin to her hairline. The sound and sight of her response, rather than awakening my thirst again, seemed only to speed the rush of my more human reactions. I couldn't remember ever feeling this alive. I doubted I ever had, even when I'd been alive. The blush on your cheeks is lovely, I murmured. I gently extracted my left hand from hers and arranged it so that I was cradling her face between my palms. Her pupils dilated and her heartbeat increased. I wanted so much to kiss her then. Her soft, curving lips, ever so slightly parted, mesmerized me and drew me forward. But, though these new human emotions now seemed so much stronger than anything else, I didn't fully trust myself. I knew I needed one more test. I thought I'd pass through Alice's knot, but still felt something was lacking. I realized now what more I had to do. One thing I'd always avoided Never let my mind explore. Be very still. I warned her. Her breath hitched. Slowly, I leaned close, watching her expression for any hint that this was unwelcome to her. I found none. Finally, I let my head dip forward and turned it to lean my cheek against the base of her throat. The heat of her warm-blooded life pulsed through her fragile skin and into the cold stone of my body. That pulse leaped beneath my touch. I kept my breathing steady as a machine, in and out, controlled. I waited, judging every minuscule happening inside my body. Perhaps I waited longer than necessary, but it was a very pleasant place to linger. When I felt sure that no trap waited for me here, I proceeded. Cautiously, I readjusted, using slow, steady movements so that nothing would surprise or frighten her. As my hands drifted from her jaw to the points of her shoulders, she shivered, and for a moment, I lost my careful hold on my breathing. I recovered, settling myself again, 
and then moved my head so that my ear was directly over her heart. The sound of it, loud before, seemed to surround me in stereo now. The earth beneath me didn't seem quite as steady, as if it rocked faintly to the beat of her heart. The sigh escaped against my will. Ah. I wished I could stay like this forever, immersed in the sound of her heart and warmed by her skin. It was time for the final test, though, and I wanted it behind me. For the first time, as I breathed in the sear of her scent, I let myself imagine it. Rather than blocking my thoughts, cutting them off and forcing them deep down, out of my conscious mind, I allowed them to range unfettered. They did not go willingly, not now, but I forced myself to go where I had always avoided. I imagined tasting her, draining her. I'd had enough experience to know what the relief would feel like if I were to utterly quench my most bestial need. Her blood had so much more pull for me than any other humans I'd encountered. I could only assume that the relief and pleasure would be that much more intense. Her body would soothe my aching throat, erasing all the months of fire. It would feel as if I had never burned for her. The alleviation of pain would be total. The sweetness of her blood on my tongue was harder to imagine. I knew I had never experienced any blood so perfectly matched to my desire, but I was sure it would satisfy every craving I had ever known. For the first time in three quarters of a century, the span I had survived without human blood, I would be totally sated. My body would feel strong and whole. It would be many weeks before I thirsted again. I played the sequence of events through to the end, surprised, even as I let these taboo imaginings loose, at how little they appealed to me now. Even withholding the inevitable sequel, the return of the thirst, the emptiness of the world without her, I felt no desire to act on my imaginings. I also saw very clearly in that moment that there was no separate monster and never had been one. Eager to disconnect my mind from my desires, I had, as was my habit, personified that hated part of myself to distance it from the parts that I'd considered me. Just as I had created the harpy to give myself someone to fight, it was a coping mechanism, and not a very good one. Better to see myself as the whole, bad and good, and work with the reality of it. My breathing continued steadily, the bite of her scent a welcome counterpoint to the glut of other physical sensations that overwhelmed me as I held her. I thought I understood a little better what had happened to me before, in the violent reaction that had terrified us both. I had been so convinced that I might be overwhelmed, that when I actually was overwhelmed, it was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. My anxiety, the agonizing visions I'd obsessed over, plus the months of self-doubt that had shaken my former confidence, all combined to weaken the determination that I now knew was absolutely up to the job of protecting Bella. Even Alice's nightmare vision was suddenly less vibrant, the colors leeching away. Its power to shake me was ebbing because, and this was obvious now, that future was entirely impossible. Bella and I would leave this place hand in hand, and my life would finally begin. We were through the knot. I had no doubt Alice saw this, too, and that she was rejoicing. Though I was exceptionally comfortable in my current position, I was also eager for the rest of my life to unfold. I leaned away from her, letting my hands trace along the length of her arms as they dropped to my side. Full of simple happiness to just see her face again, she looked at me curiously, unaware of the momentous occurrences inside my head. It won't be so hard again, I promised, though I realized as I spoke that my words probably made little sense to her. Was that very hard for you? She asked with sympathetic eyes. 
Her concern warmed me to the core. Not nearly as bad as I imagined it would be. And you? She gave me one disbelieving glance. No, it wasn't bad. For me. She made it look so easy, being embraced by a vampire. But it must take more courage than she let on. You know what I mean. She smiled a wide, warm, lopsidedly dimpled grin. It was clear that if it did take any effort to bear my nearness, she would never admit to it. Giddy. That was the only word I could think of to describe the high I was experiencing. It wasn't a word I often thought of in relation to myself. Every thought in my head wanted to spill out through my lips. I wanted to hear every thought in hers. That, at least, was nothing new. Everything else was new. Everything had changed. I reached for her hand, without first exhaustively debating the act in my mind, simply because I wanted to feel it against my skin. I felt free to be spontaneous for the first time. These new impulses were completely unrelated to the old. Here, I placed my palm against my cheek. Do you feel how warm it is? Her reaction to this first instinctive act of mine was more than I'd expected. Her fingers trembled against my cheekbone. Her eyes grew round and the smile slipped away. Her heartbeat and her breathing accelerated. Before I could regret the deed, she'd leaned closer and whispered, Don't move. A thrill shivered through me. Her request was easily accomplished. I froze myself into the absolute stillness that humans were incapable of duplicating. I didn't know what she intended, acclimating herself to my lack of a circulatory system seemed unlikely, but was eager to find out. I closed my eyes. I wasn't sure whether I did this to free her from the self-consciousness of my scrutiny or because I wanted no distractions from this moment. Her hand began to move very slowly. First, she stroked my cheek. Her fingertips grazed across my closed eyelids and then brushed a half circle beneath them. Where her skin met mine, it left a trail of tingling heat. She traced the length of my nose and then, with the trembling in her fingers more pronounced now, the shape of my lips. My frozen form melted. I let my mouth fall slightly open so that I could breathe in the nearness of her. One finger caressed my bottom lip again, and then her hand fell away. I felt the air cool between us as she leaned back. I opened my eyes and met her gaze. Her face was flushed. Her heart still raced. I felt a phantom echo of the pace inside my own body, though no blood pushed it. I wanted so many things things i had not felt any need for in my entire immortal life before i met her things i was sure i had not wanted before i was immortal either and i felt that some of them things i'd always thought impossible might in fact be very possible but while i felt comfortable with her now as far as my thirst was concerned I was still too strong, so much stronger than she was, every limb of my body unyielding as steel. I must always think of her fragility. It would take time to learn exactly how to move around her. She stared at me, waiting, wondering what I thought of her touches. I wish, I wish you could feel the complexity. I fumbled to explain the confusion I feel that you could understand. A tendril of her hair caught in the breeze, danced in the sun, catching the light with a reddish shine. I reached out to feel the texture of that errant lock between my fingers. And then, because it was so close, I couldn't resist stroking her face. Her cheek felt like velvet left out in the sun. Her head tilted into my hand, 
but her eyes remained intent on my face. Tell me, she breathed. I couldn't imagine where to even begin. I don't think I can. I've told you. On the one hand, the hunger, the thirst, that. I gave her an apologetic half-smile. Deplorable creature I am. I feel for you. And I think you can understand that to an extent. Though, as you are not addicted to any illegal substances, you probably can't empathize completely. But my fingers seemed to search out her lips of their own accord. I brushed them lightly, finally. They were softer than I'd imagined, warmer. There are other hungers, I continued. Hungers I don't even understand, that are foreign to me. She gave me that slightly skeptical look again. I may understand that better than you think. I'm not used to feeling so human, I admitted. Is it always like this? The wild current singing through my system, the magnetic pull drawing me forward, the feeling that there might never be a closeness that would be close enough. For me? She paused, considering. No, never. Never before this. I took both her hands between mine. I don't know how to be close to you. I cautioned her. I don't know if I can. Where to set the limits to keep her safe? How to keep selfish desire from pushing those limits unwisely? She shifted closer to me. I held myself still and careful while she rested the side of her face against the bare skin of my chest. I'd never been more grateful for Alice's influence on my wardrobe than in this second. Her eyes slid closed. She sighed contentedly. This is enough. The invitation was not something I could resist. I knew I was capable of getting this much right. With meticulous care, I wrapped my arms lightly around her, truly holding her in my embrace for the first time. I pressed my lips against the crown of her head, breathing in her warm scent. A first kiss, though a stealthy one, unrequited. She chuckled once. You're better at this than you give yourself credit for. I have human instincts, I murmured into her hair. They may be buried deep, but they're there. The passing of time was meaningless while I cradled her, my lips against her hair. Her heart moved languorously now. Her breath was slow and even against my skin. I only noticed the change when the shadow of the trees fell over us. Without the reflection off my skin, the meadow seemed suddenly darker, evening rather than afternoon. Bella heaved a deep sigh, not contented this time, but regretful. You have to go? I guessed. I thought you couldn't read my mind. I grinned and then pressed one last hidden kiss to the top of her head. It's getting clearer. We'd been a long time here, though now it seemed like mere seconds. She would have human needs she was neglecting. I thought of the long, slow trek to get to the meadow, and I had an idea. I pulled away, reluctant to end our embrace no matter what came next, and placed my hands lightly on her shoulders. Can I show you something? I asked. Show me what? She asked, a hint of suspicion in her voice. I realized my tone was more than a little enthusiastic. I'll show you how I travel in the forest, I explained. Her lips pursed, doubtful, and the crease between her brows appeared, deeper than before, even when I'd nearly attacked her. It surprised me a little. She was usually so curious and fearless. Don't worry, 
I reassured her. You'll be very safe, and we'll get to your truck much faster. I grinned encouragingly at her. She considered for a minute, and then whispered, Will you turn into a bat? I couldn't suppress my laughter. I didn't really want to. I couldn't remember ever feeling so free to be myself. Of course, that wasn't exactly true. I was always free and open when it was just me and my family. However, I never felt like this with my family. Ecstatic, wild, every cell of my body alive in a new electric way. Being with Bella intensified all sensation. Like I haven't heard that one before. I teased once I could speak again. She grinned. Right. I'm sure you get that all the time. I was on my feet in an instant, holding out one hand to her. She eyed it doubtfully. Come on, little coward. I coaxed. Climb on my back. She stared at me for a moment, hesitating. I wasn't sure whether she was wary of this idea of mine, or just wasn't sure exactly how to approach me. We were very new to this physical closeness, and there was still plenty of shyness between us. Deciding that the latter was the problem, I made it easy for her. I lifted her from the ground and gently arranged her limbs around me, as if for a piggyback ride. Her pulse quickened and her breath caught, but once she was in place, her arms and legs constricted around me. I felt enveloped in the warmth of her body. I'm a bit heavier than your average backpack. She sounded worried that I might not be able to bear her weight. Ha! I snorted. It struck me how easy it was, not to carry her insignificant weight, but to have her literally wrapped around me. My thirst was so wholly overshadowed by my happiness that it barely caused me any conscious pain. I took her hand from where it was gripped around my neck and held her palm to my nose. I inhaled as deeply as I could. Yes, there the pain was, real, but unimpressive. What was a little fire to all this light? Easier all the time, I breathed. I took off at a relaxed slope, choosing the smoothest route back to our starting point. It would cost me a few extra seconds to go the long way but we would still get to her truck in minutes rather than hours. It was better than to jostle her with a more vertical path. Another new, joyous experience. I'd always loved to run. For nearly a hundred years, it had been my purest physical happiness. But now, sharing this with her, no distance between us bodily or physically, I realized how much more pleasure there could be in simply running than I'd ever imagined. I wondered if it thrilled her as much as it did me. One qualm nagged at me. I'd been in a hurry to get her home as soon as that seemed to be her wish. However, surely we should have concluded that most momentous interlude with a proper finale. A sort of seal on our new understanding? A benediction but I'd been too hasty to realize it was missing until we were already in motion. It wasn't too late. My system was electrified again as I thought of it. A true kiss. Once I'd assumed it impossible. Once I'd mourned that this impossibility seemed to hurt her as well as me. Now I was sure it was both possible and fast approaching. The electricity ricocheted around the inside of my stomach and I wondered why humans had thought to name such a wild sensation butterflies. I slowed to a smooth stop just a few paces from where she'd parked. Exhilarating, isn't it? I asked, eager for her reaction. She didn't respond, and her limbs retained their taut grip around my waist and neck. A few quiet seconds passed with no answer. What was wrong? Bella? Her breath came in a gasp, and I realized that she'd been holding it. I should have noticed that. 
I think I need to lie down, she said faintly. Oh, I was in dire need of practice with human. I hadn't even thought of the possibility of motion sickness. I'm sorry. I waited for her to release her hold, but she didn't relax one locked muscle. I think I need help, she whispered. With slow, gentle movements, I freed first her legs, then her arms, and pulled her around so that I was holding her, cradled against my chest. The state of her complexion alarmed me at first, but I had seen this same chalky green before. I'd held her in my arms that day, too. Yet what a wholly different affair it was now. I knelt down and set her on a soft patch of ferns. How do you feel? Dizzy, I think. Put your head between your knees, I advised. She complied automatically, as if this was a practice response. I sat beside her, listening to her measured breathing. I found that I was more anxious than the situation merited. I knew this was nothing serious, just a bit of queasiness. And yet, seeing her pale and ill bothered me more than was reasonable. A few moments later, she lifted her head experimentally. She was still pale, but not as green. A faint sheen of sweat covered her brow. I guess that wasn't the best idea, I muttered feeling like an ass. She smiled a wan smile. No, it was very interesting. She lied. Ha, I huffed sourly. You're as white as a ghost. No, you're as white as me. She took a slow breath. I think I should have closed my eyes. As she said the words, Her lips followed suit. Remember that next time. Her color was improving, and my tension eased in direct correlation with the pink infusing her cheeks. Next time? She groaned theatrically. I laughed at her sham scowl. Show off, she muttered. Her lower lip jutted out, rounded and full. It looked incredibly soft. I imagined how it would give, bringing us even closer. I rolled to my knees, facing her. I felt nervous and restless and impatient and unsure. The yearning to be closer to her reminded me of the thirst that used to control me. This, too, was demanding, impossible to ignore. Her breath was hot against my face. I leaned closer. Open your eyes, Bella. She complied slowly, looking at me through her dense lashes for a moment before lifting her chin so that our faces were aligned. I was thinking, while I was running. My voice trailed off. This was not the most romantic beginning. Her eyes narrowed. About not hitting the trees, I hope. I chuckled as she tried to hold back a grin. Silly Bella. Running is second nature to me. It's not something I have to think about. Show off. She repeated, with more emphasis this time. We were off topic. It was surprising this was even possible. Close as our faces were. I smiled and redirected. No. I was thinking there was something I wanted to try. I put my hands lightly on either side of her face, leaving her plenty of room to move away if this was unwelcome. Her breath caught, and she automatically angled her head closer to mine. I used an eighth of a second to recalibrate, testing every system in my body to be completely positive that nothing would take me off guard. My thirst was well under control, sublimated to the very bottom of my physical needs. I regulated the pressure in my hands, in my arms, the way my torso curved toward her, so that my touch would be lighter against her skin than the breeze. Though I was sure the precaution was unnecessary, I held my breath. 
There was no such thing as too careful, after all. Her eyelids slid shut. I closed the tiny distance between us and pressed my lips softly against hers. Though I'd thought I was prepared, I was not entirely ready for the combustion. What strange alchemy was this, that the touch of lips should be so much more than the touch of fingers? It made no logical sense that simple contact between this specific area of skin should be so much more powerful than anything I'd yet experienced. It felt as if a new sun was bursting into being where our mouths met, and my whole body was filled to a shatter point with the brilliant light of it. I only had a fraction of a second to grapple with the potency of this kiss before the alchemy impacted Bella. She gasped in reaction, her lips parting against mine, the fever of her breath burning my skin. Her arms wound around my neck, her fingers twisted into my hair, she used that leverage to crush her lips more tightly to mine. Her lips felt warmer than before, as fresh blood flowed into them. They opened wider. An invitation. An invitation it would not be safe for me to accept. Gingerly, with the lightest force possible, I eased her face away from mine, leaving my fingertips in place against her skin to keep her at that distance. Apart from that small shift, I held myself motionless and tried, if not to ignore the temptation, at least to separate myself from it. I noted the unpleasant return of a few predatory reactions, an excess of venom in my mouth, a tightening in my core. But these were superficial responses. While perhaps it would be unfair to say that rationality was in total control, at least it was not a feeding passion that made that statement untrue. A much more agreeable passion held me in its thrall. Its nature, however, did not eliminate the need to moderate it. Bella's expression was both overwhelmed and apologetic. Oops, she said. I couldn't help but think what her innocent actions might have precipitated just a few hours ago. That's an understatement. I agreed. She was unaware of the progress I'd made today, but she had always acted as if I were in perfect control of myself, even when it wasn't true. It was a relief to finally feel as if I deserved some of that trust. She tried to move back, but my hands were locked around her face. Should I? No, I assured her. It's tolerable. Wait for a moment, please. I wanted to be very careful that nothing was escaping me. Already, my muscles had relaxed and the influx of venom dissipated. The urge to wrap my arms around her and continue the alchemy of kissing was a harder impulse to deny, but I used my decades of practicing self-control to make the right choice. There, I said, when I was totally calm. She was fighting another smile. Tolerable? She asked. I laughed. I'm stronger than I thought. I would have never believed how in control I was able to be now. This was very rapid progress, indeed. It's nice to know. I wish I could say the same. I'm sorry. You are only human, after all. She rolled her eyes at my weak joke. Thanks so much. The light that had filled my body during our kiss lingered. I felt so much happiness. I wasn't sure how to contain it all. The overwhelming joy and general bemusement made me worry I wasn't being responsible enough. I should take her home. It wasn't so hard to think of ending this afternoon's utopia because we would leave together. I stood and offered her my hand. This time she took it quickly and I pulled her to her feet. She wobbled there, looking unsteady. Are you still faint from the run? I asked. Or was it my kissing expertise? I laughed out loud. She wrapped her free hand around my wrist to steady herself. I can't be sure, she teased. I'm still woozy. I think it's some of both.
though. Her body swayed closer to mine. It seemed intentional rather than vertiginous. Maybe you should let me drive. All disequilibrium seemed to vanish. Her shoulders squared. Are you insane? If she were driving, I would need her to keep both hands on the wheel, and I could do nothing to distract her. If I were driving, however, there would be much more leeway. I can drive better than you on your best day. You have much slower reflexes. I smiled so that she would know I was teasing, mostly. She didn't argue with the facts. I'm sure that's true, but I don't think my nerves or my truck could take it. I tried to do the dazzling thing she'd accused me of before. I still wasn't exactly sure what qualified. Some trust, please, Bella? It didn't work, perhaps because she was looking down. She patted her jeans pocket, then pulled out her key and wrapped her fingers into a fist around it. She looked up again and shook her head. Nope, she told me. Not a chance. She started toward the road, stepping around me. Whether she was actually still dizzy or just moved clumsily, I didn't know. But she staggered on the second step and I caught her before she could fall. I pulled her against my chest. Bella. I breathed. All the jocularity vanished from her eyes and she leaned into me. Her face tilted up toward mine. Kissing her immediately seemed like both a fantastic and a terrible idea. I forced myself to err on the side of caution. I've already expended a great deal of personal effort at this point to keep you alive. I reminded her in a playful tone. I'm not about to let you behind the wheel of a vehicle when you can't even walk straight. Besides... Friends don't let friends drive drunk, I concluded, quoting the Ad Council slogan. It was a dated reference for her. She'd been only three when the campaign was launched. Drunk, she protested. I grinned a crooked smile at her. You're intoxicated by my very presence. She sighed, accepting defeat. I can't argue with that. Holding her fist up, she let the key drop from her hand and fall into mine. Take it easy, she cautioned. My truck is a senior citizen. Very sensible. Her lips pursed into a frown. And are you not affected at all by my presence? Affected? She'd utterly transformed every part of me. I barely recognized myself. For the first time in a hundred years, I was grateful to be what I was. Every aspect of being a vampire, all but the danger to her, was suddenly acceptable to me because it was what let me live long enough to find Bella. The decades I had endured would not have been so difficult had I known what was waiting for me, that my existence was advancing towards something better than I could have imagined. It had not been years of killing time as I had thought. It had been years of progress, refining, preparing, mastering myself so that I could have this now. I wasn't entirely sure of this new self yet. The violent ecstasy suffusing my every cell seemed unsustainable in the long term. Still, I never wanted to go back to the old me. That Edward seemed unfinished now, incomplete as though half of him was missing. It would have been impossible for him to do this. I leaned down and pressed my lips to the corner of her jaw, just above her pulsing artery. I let my lips brush softly along her jawline to her chin and then kissed my way back to her ear, feeling the velvet give of her warm skin under the faint pressure. I returned slowly to her chin, so close to her lips, she shivered in my arms, reminding me that what was unprecedented warmth for me was icy winter to her. I loosed my hold. Regardless, I whispered in her ear, I have better reflexes. <laughs>